Franklin, are you ready? Yes, sir. I'm ready, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Once again, thank you for joining us uh, this evening for our regular Wednesday evening Bible study. It is uh, time worth spending uh, an hour of, uh, you know, looking into the scriptures as well as uh, interacting and uh, asking questions to be able to uh, learn from uh, being able to, you know, uh, interact with each other. So we have our regular attendees uh, today. And of course, today we also have Roshan from Nepal. I think you're uh, in, still in Taplejung. Are you uh, in uh, Roshan? Can you hear us, Roshan? Muted. Yeah, I think you are on mute. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Uh, let's let's go ahead and start the study. And today, as uh, I had uh, posted on our group, that we will have a short mini series of two sessions on uh, something that Franklin Poppins, our elder in Hyderabad, has prepared for us. And uh, uh, you already know that his expertise is in uh, apologetics with a special focus uh, on science and uh, a micro focus on cosmology. So, <laughs> so we are going to get a treat today of uh, listening to our resident scientist, uh, Franklin Poppins. Uh, and we thank you, Franklin, for taking the time to study and uh, share with us this, uh, these, these talks. Let's, as usual, begin our uh, study by asking Praveen to lead us in, a, in an opening prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are in your presence, thanking you for giving us another opportunity to come together and to study your word, O oh Lord. Lord, your creation speaks about your glory, as Franklin Lord is going to teach us and help us understand your marvelous and glorious creation and your purpose behind it and uh, how greatly you have formed it for us, Lord. Uh, I pray that your grace may be upon him, Lord, as he is going to uh, bring science and uh, Bible together into our midst, oh Lord. I pray by your grace and spirit we may be able to relate to that and understand your glory, O oh God. I also pray, Lord, that our study and our discussions may be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Praveen. And let me also welcome Emmanuel joining us. Thank you, Emmanuel, no, for taking the time. Uh, Emmanuel is in Vishakapatnam at this moment. And of course, Doris has also joined us. And I'm presuming uh, Veronica is uh, on the other on the other device, but thank you all for joining. Let me hand it over to Franklin, who will lead us in a, uh, uh, a short study, and then you are welcome to ask him questions. We can interact uh, for a few minutes after that. Go ahead, Franklin. Good evening to you all, and uh, uh, thank you, Pastor. I love apologetics, <laughs> and I especially like this integrating uh, scientific findings and the biblical uh, evidence and uh, this, I feel this is the, a systematic way of uh, going about. Okay, uh, let, let's begin. Uh, uh, over the past years, I mean, I was obsessed with the subject of science and how we understand it in the light of the uh, biblical narrative. Now, uh, today we are going to talk on a very important subject. And uh, I would like you to please give me your undivided attention. And then, so welcome to you all. Uh, thank you all for joining. Together, we are going to embark on a fascinating study, uh, a comparative study of science and Bible. We are going to do that. And uh, as we do that, my subject today, uh, let, let me say a thank you to our pastor and uh, thank you to all of you for joining in. And uh, my subject today will be recent scientific and uh, recent scientific discoveries and findings. By recent, what I mean is that which has, uh, the, which has come to light over the past 100 years, okay? Now, I want to study this subject of recent scientific findings under four stages. Stage one, what are these findings and are they proven and established? 
and in stage two, we digress a little bit and we look, we look into the Bible. What does the Bible, what is the, what does the Bible say on the universe? Uh, why do I do that? Because God gave us two books. He gave us the book of nature and the book of uh, scripture. The book of nature is a general revelation which pinpoints you to, a, uh, to the book of, uh, the, to the Bible, which is a revelation, a, a detailed revelation. So we look into the Bible and see what, what is it to say on the creation account. And then we go to the Bible and then in stage three, what we do is we, we will do a comparative study, uh, scientific evidence and biblical evidence. We will uh, juxtapose both and uh, uh, we will uh, evaluate, we will see are there similarities or are there dissimilarities okay and then in the last uh, stage will be a big question for you and for me what are the implications of these recent scientific findings how do they impact you and how do they impact me uh, this is the most uh, uh, the what we call the most important part of my presentation uh, we are going to come up with some astounding uh, discoveries, uh, uh, some conclusions which are mind-boggling. I must say even heart-stopping. Okay, let's straight away go into it. But before I go into it, let me just ask you a question. I mean, all of us, I believe, we heard the term Big Bang model. We remember we heard it in our college days, in our school days. But is there someone who has not heard it? I can clarify it in two sentences. Is there someone who has not heard it? Okay. I take it for granted that everyone is aware of it. Um, so we are going to look at the subject of Big Bang. And then what do you think about the Big Bang? You see, uh, 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 let me first and foremost acknowledge my sources. And, uh, I have prepared today's presentation courtesies to Dr. Euros, astrophysicist and ast apologist, and reasons to believe, and Grace Communion International. Okay, and then if I may have your permission, let me begin with a quiz program. Uh, I was an official quiz master uh, about a decade back. Uh, and then I also uh, like question and answers because I believe this is the easiest and the best way to learn new things and to get confirmation. Okay, uh, let me begin with the quiz program. Uh, first question, can science prove the existence of God? Uh, you may say yes or no. Okay, but I leave it to you. Yes, 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 Praveen. Yes, I'm Praveen. Answering, yes, I'm answering your question, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, I leave it to you, but please take this question. Question one, can science prove the existence of God? A second question I have is, science indicates that God is a personal God. Okay, now we move on to the third one. Big Bang model. Is this good news or bad news? Uh, I mean, you'll have to um, think it over and you have to give me your assessment, okay? And then, uh, and then who or who was the first to speak or teach about the Big Bang model? And one last bumper question is, uh, which is the only worldview that is 100% accurate in its cosmology? Which is the only worldview that is 100% accurate in its cosmology? Okay, uh, those are some questions I had. Uh, we will take up, we will address these answers, we will take up the answers at the end of my presentation. Okay, uh, let's uh, go into our subject. First and foremost, the title of my presentation today is Cosmology Confirms the Bible. Okay, uh, let's begin. Uh, what is cosmology? Uh, now, physics has a branch known as astronomy. Astronomy has a branch called as, as a cosmology. Cosmology is a scientific study of the universe, its origin, its history, its structure, and ultimate destiny. So we are going to study about the origin of the universe. Did the universe always exist or did it have a beginning? How did it begin? Uh, Aristotle in the fourth century, uh, 384 to 322 said, the cosmos, that is the universe was eternal with no beginning, with no beginning. And then uh, skip, uh, then uh, fast forward 20th century. Astounding, mind boggling discoveries and findings were there in astronomy. Uh, 
I remember, I mean, I'm sure many of you, many of you will call, will recall uh, uh, at first, I think it was first Edwin, uh, no, it was Edwin Hubble's images, telescopic images. And then we had Einstein's general new uh, theory in gravity known as the general theory of relativity. And then we had space-time theorems. Uh, here I'd like to deal with two, there are two specific theorems. And then last of all, uh, design in the universe. Now, the paradigm in the scientific community is they acknowledge there is a design in the world, but they deny the existence of a des designer. For instance, take uh, Stephen Hawking's his famous book, na, um, uh, The Grand Design. He likes the book Grand Design, but uh, in the, he acknowledges there is a uh, designer, but he says this particular designer is not a personal god. And so we have this uh, problem of uh, design and designer. Now, is, is there a design and how do you establish, what is the best way to verify a designer? Uh, we will study one more discovery and that is the dark energy. Uh, this is a recent discovery. It was discovered only in 1999. I mean, uh, this particular dark energy uh, shows you uh, some, some uh, what, what should I say? I mean, mind blowing uh, conclusions, okay? And then, so we have, we have many theories of the origin of the universe. We have steady state theory, we have static theory, we have string theory, we have oscillating theory, the big bang theory, and on and on. Most, the most widely accepted and the best explanation for the origin of the universe is the big bang model. Okay, that's the best, uh, the best explanation, best and widely accepted. Okay, let's move on. Uh, at this uh, point, uh, may I request Praveen sir to please, to please play uh, for us a video. How did the universe originate? It's a, just a five minutes clip. Was the universe always here or did it have a beginning? If so, how did it start? From ancient times, philosophers and theologians have debated these questions. But it wasn't until the 20th century that a series of stunning scientific discoveries finally enabled us to get some answers. The story begins in 1912, when American astronomer Vesto Slipher observed that light coming from distant nebulae, clouds of dust and gas in outer space, appeared redder than expected. Why was this important? Here's where your high school science pays off. Remember learning about the Doppler effect? The frequency of sound, light, or other waves changes as the source and observer move toward or away from each other. To demonstrate this, your science teacher likely played a recording of a train whistle. The pitch of the whistle lowers, that is, the sound wave stretches out as the train recedes into the distance. Well, the same thing happens with light. If a distant star or galaxy is moving away from us, the light coming from that object will also stretch out. Since in the spectrum of visible light, red light corresponds to the longest wavelengths, physicists say light that has been stretched out has been red shifted. This evidence of red shift suggested the nebulae were moving away from us. In 1924, astronomer Edwin Hubble, working with a new 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson in California, showed that Slipher's nebulae were not just clouds of gas around distant stars, but actually distant galaxies beyond our Milky Way. Soon after that, the Belgian physicist Georges Lemaitre correlated Slipher's redshift data with Hubble's measurements of the distances to other galaxies. Lemaitre showed that galaxies that were farther away were receding faster than those close at hand. That suggested a spherical expansion of the universe in all directions of space, as if the universe were expanding like a balloon from a singular explosive beginning, from a big bang. Oddly, Albert Einstein had earlier tumbled to this idea, but then dismissed it. Einstein's new theory of gravity, known as general relativity, envisioned massive bodies altering the curvature of space, like a bowling ball making a depression on a trampoline. Einstein's concept of gravity implied that space would contract in on itself 
unless gravity was continually counteracted by the expansion of space. For this reason, Einstein posited a constantly acting repulsive force, known as the cosmological constant, to counter gravitational attraction. But that implied a dynamic and expanding universe, and also a beginning. To avoid this conclusion, Einstein altered his own equations by arbitrarily assigning a precise value to the force of expansion to ensure that the strength of gravity and the repulsive force exactly balanced. Thus, he depicted the universe in a perfectly poised static state, neither expanding from a beginning nor contracting toward a collapse. But then with Slipher and Hubble's discoveries, the heavens talked back. In 1927, Lemaitre informed Einstein, in a taxi cab no less, about the redshift evidence for an expanding universe. In 1931, Einstein visited Hubble at the Mount Wilson Observatory and viewed the evidence for himself. Later, he announced, to his great credit, that denying the evidence for the universe having had a beginning was the greatest blunder of my scientific career. Throughout the 20th century, physicists proposed other theories that denied a cosmic beginning. One by one, new evidence showed each to be inadequate. By the 1990s, the Big Bang Theory had prevailed as the best explanation for multiple lines of astronomical evidence. So why was such evidence upsetting to Einstein and to many other scientists? Princeton University physicist Robert Dickey explained, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of explaining the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. And so it would. But if the physical universe of matter, energy, space, and time had a beginning, it becomes extremely difficult to conceive of a physical or material cause for the origin of the universe. After all, it was matter and energy that first came into existence at the Big Bang. Before that, no matter or energy would have yet existed to do the causing. Consequently, whatever did cause the universe to exist would need to be immaterial and exist beyond space and time. To many scientists and philosophers, all this sounds an awful lot like the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute, an author of Return of the God Hypothesis for Prager University. Does a design require a designer? Keep that. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, he's Dr. Stephen Mayers, a, a scientist apologist. Uh, I thought it would serve as an introduction. Okay, let's move on. Uh, what is how do we explain what is the Big Bang? How do we explain it? The Big Bang is not a Big Bang as we, as most lay people understand. I mean, when you say Big Bang, you get images of an explosion, a bomb explosion or a dynamite exploding. It's not like that. Uh, it, this would this would mean if there were an explosion or if there it was it, it would mean there was a disorder, chaos, and destruction. It's not so. The word Big Bang represents uh, immensely powerful, yet carefully orchestrated and planned, controlled, powerful, sudden release of matter, energy, and space and time within the strict confines, within the strict confines of, of very carefully fine-tuned physical constants of laws which govern the universe. The power and care this explosion reveals exceeds human potential by, by multiple orders of magnitude. So the word Big Bang means uh, a controlled, orchestrated uh, release of uh, at a particular uh, point of matter, energy, time, and space. That is called Big Bang. Who coined this uh, phrase Big Bang? It was the British astronomer, Fred Hoyle, Sir Fred Hoyle, who coined the expression in an attempt to ridicule the upcoming challenger of his steady state hypothesis, he objected to any theory that would place the origin or the cause of the universe outside the universe itself. Hence, in his judgment, outside the realm of scientific inquiry, 
Now, Fred Hoyle was, a, was an astrophysicist and then he hails from an Anglican background, but he was anti-Christian. Anti Yet, he writes something interesting. He writes, uh, there is a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. This is a remarkable conception in his book, uh, in his book uh, uh, titled The Nature of the Universe. Can you imagine uh, a, a, a gentleman writes a book on, on the nature of the universe and he keeps attacking, he, he keeps blasting the Christian faith and he's bad-mouthing Christians. Now, I don't know why he does that, but uh, this, uh, this quote was very useful. At least he had the honesty and the courage to admit that the Bible has a, deal, has a good deal of cosmology, which is an extra amazing fact. Okay, uh, now let's, ex let's understand what is Big Bang. Now, when I say Big Bang, there are four characteristics or four properties you have to keep in mind. I mean, there are many more. Maybe we'll, the next episode we'll take up. But today I want to deal with only four, four characteristics or properties. The first one is the universe had a beginning. Big Bang means the universe had a beginning. Secondly, the universe continues to expand. And third is the universe is governed by fixed laws, physical laws. And the fourth uh, property is one of the laws is the all pervasive law of decay known as the second law of thermodynamics or uh, what we call um, uh, Murphy's law. Okay, the, remember this. When I say Big Bang, remember these four characteristics. Okay, and then let's move on. Now let's explain the first uh, uh, component. The universe began to exist. Let's have a little more uh, in-depth understanding of what is mean. What does it mean the universe has a beginning? It means there is a, the universe can be traced to a singularity beginning. That is, uh, the, the universe's origin can be traced to a single point or a single event. And then it, where you, where the, it, what comes into existence is matter, energy, space, and time. That is known as the singularity uh, beginning. Uh, it is also known, uh, it, it, this is a phys, uh, phys, technical physical term. We call it the singularity beginning or the cosmic beginning of the universe. A second thing we should understand about the beginning of the universe is time itself began to exist. Time itself began to exist. The cosmos had a beginning in the, in the finite past. Time, uh, now, as you all know, uh, Christianity teaches that time is linear. It is linear for both for the universe and for you and for me. What do I mean by linear? It moves forward. It inexorably moves forward. That is, it has a past, it has a present, and it has a future. Okay? Uh, that is what I mean. Time. So, there was a time when time did not exist. The dimension of time did not exist. And this, the, state, the dimension of state began to exist at the Big Bang event, at the cosmic event. Okay. One more point I would like to begin is, the universe had a, a transcendent cause. I mean, it had, how did the universe come into being? Uh, the Big Bang says there was a causal agent or a transcendent cause outside matter, outside space and energy. Uh, it is saying an, an extraneous factor uh, beyond uh, the matter, the energy, time and space caused the universe to come into extent. The universe had a, had a trans, had an absolute beginning. Uh, sorry, the universe had a transcendent cause. Uh, okay, uh, when remember when I say the the universe had a beginning, just remember these three factors. The universe had a singularity beginning. The universe time began to exist, and uh, the universe had a transcendent cause or a transcendent agent to bring the universe into existence. Now let's move on to the second um, a fundamental feature of the Big Bang. And that is the universe continues to expand. The universe in which you and I live, uh, we live, is on an expansion, is on an average, in a state of average expansion from the uh, beginning, from the day, from the cosmic event. The universe is expanding from the cosmic beginning. The expansion rate of the universe is finely tuned. The, the rate of expansion should not be too much. It should not be too less. 
it is uh, it is tuned uh, to the precision to the exactitude okay and then at this point let me request uh, praveen sir to play a video for us now there is a component called dark energy and this is a, a new a new discovery and then uh, I let praveen play for us and then i'll make some comments praveen sir about dark energy dr eurosis today we understand what's responsible for the expansion of the universe gravity works to slow down the expansion of the universe something called dark energy which was only discovered in 1999 causes the universe to expand at a faster and Brother, faster the, rate the, 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 what is this dark the, energy is not it's the energy the embedded the in the space surface playing. of the universe and as the universe expands Ravi? the surface gets bigger yeah so only the audio is playing the video is not playing expansion of the universe. Gravity works to slow down the expansion of the universe. Something called dark energy, which was only discovered in 1999, causes the universe to expand at a faster and faster rate. What is this dark energy? It's the energy embedded in the space surface of the universe. And as the universe expands, the surface gets bigger. As the surface gets bigger, dark energy becomes progressively more and more powerful in its capacity to accelerate the expansion of the universe. So in 2015, the universe will expand at a faster rate than it did in 2014. That is a tiny impact on your waistline, a very tiny impact, so don't try to blame too much uh, on uh, dark energy. But we now know that dark energy makes up about 74% of all the stuff of the universe. And we know that the expansion of the universe determines what kind of objects we get in the history of the universe. So for example, if dark energy were a little more powerful than what we measure, it would cause the universe to expand at such a rapid rate that gravity would never be able to collect gas and condense it into galaxies, stars, and planets. And if the universe is forever dispersed gas, there is no possibility of life. On the other hand, if you were to make dark energy a little bit weaker than what we measure, then gravity would so efficiently collect all the gas of the universe that relatively quickly all the matter in the universe would be collapsed into black holes and neutron stars where the density exceeds 2 billion tons per level teaspoonful. At density so extreme that molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even protons and electrons are impossible. And of course, life is impossible. And what amazed the physics community was it discovered the degree to which you have to fine-tune dark energy to get the stars and planets showing up at the right time in cosmic history so that life is possible. You literally have to fine-tune this dark energy to one part in 10 to the 120 places in the index. Now, that's a mind-boggling big number, 122 zeros after the one. That number is bigger than the total number of protons and neutrons in the entire universe. That's only 10 to the 79. But what I've given you here is a point of comparison. Let's compare the fine-tuning design that we need to have in dark energy to make life possible compared with the very best example of human engineering design creativity. In my opinion, the best example we can come up with, with human creativity, inventiveness, and design, is a gravity wave telescope called LIGO. By far the best machine we human beings have ever built. But if we compare that best example of human engineering creativity and design to what we see just in this dark energy term, it ranks 10 to the 97 times inferior. Now this is important because now we can establish that this entity beyond space and time must be a personal being. Because we're seeing here is a level of design that tells us that the one behind dark energy, at a minimum, is 10 to the 97 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists that invented this amazing machine. 
And I've worked with some of these people. They're not dumb. They're very smart people, very well educated, but nowhere near the degree that we see in this causal agent beyond space and time. And by the way, these Caltech and MIT physicists shouldn't take all the credit. It took the finances of the U.S. taxpayer to make it possible to fund this instrument so it could actually be built by these engineers and put into operation. What does that tell us? That the one that's behind dark energy, at a minimum, is 10 to the 97 times better funded uh, than the whole collection of U.S. taxpayers. Now, I think you get my point here. This is not just simply some non-personal causal agent beyond space and time because only a personal being can manifest the attributes of intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power. And only the God of the Bible manifests these to the degree of 10 to the 97 times. You don't see that degree of uh, fine-tuning design, involvement, and care in the non-biblical religions of the world. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, that was Dr. Euros. He's an astrophysicist and a, a, a Christian apologist. I mean, uh, the dark energy is responsible for the expansion of our universe, and it has, be, it has to be fine-tuned. 10, uh, 10 followed by 122 zeros. That's a mind-boggling figure. Okay, let's move on. Okay, not only the dark energy has to be fine-tuned, all the parameters of the Big Bang has to be uh, fine-tuned. Only then, your life, physical life, is possible on the planet Earth. Now, let's move on to a third, uh, uh, third characteristics of the Big Bang. We have covered uh, the core universe has a beginning, the universe continues to expand, and the third, uh, you, uh, the third component of the U Big Bang is very simple. Uh, the universe is governed by fixed laws, fixed physical laws, and they don't change. There, there is what is called the constancy of physical laws. The universe operates on laws. Okay, uh, that's a very simple understand. In the 18th century and uh, in the 19th century, uh, men became scientific. Why? Because they believed, they believed in the laws of nature. Why did they believe in the laws of nature? Because they believed there was a lawgiver. So there is what, what we understand is the physical, the fixed laws of physics don't change. And because of that, we are able to understand the intelligence, we are able to uh, grasp the intelligibility of the universe and we are able to work on it. How do we send our men to the uh, Mars mission or uh, moon? Because now it's all fixed laws. Uh, you calculate no, uh, what are the uh, orbiting stati natural uh, satellites and what are the, uh, the, the, the spacecrafts of fellow countries and then you go on a particular path and then you're able to land on the moon or on the Jupiter. Remember, Big Bang means there are always fixed laws. And the, and the fourth last point of the Big Bang is the law of decay, TK, uh, also called as the, uh, the law of thermodynamics, okay? The universe operates on the, the, sec the law of DK, uh, second law of thermodynamics, or you can say also it is called as the law of entropy or the Murphy's law, uh, all mean the same. It means as the, you, as the universe begins to expand, it, it, as it becomes older and older, it becomes uh, colder and colder. This principle is, is uh, applicable across the board to the totality of the, of the universe. Uh, uh, you can see that this law of decay is in operation even today. Our cars deteriorate, our houses deteriorate, our human bodies deteriorate. Uh, you can see me, I'm becoming older. And then the planets decay. Our universe is, is decaying slowly and steadily. And ultimately, one day it's going to collapse or burn down. Okay, uh, that's about Big Bang uh, theory. Four components. Uh, remember the word uh, universe refers to the totality of all physical things. By physical things, we mean matter, energy, space, and time. Okay, that's about it. Uh, I have explained uh, the Big Bang. Uh, now, let me see what's our time, how much time we have. Uh, I would like to show you scientific evidence that the Big Bang is a well-proven scientific fact. Okay, it is now, I think I can complete this portion and then we can stop, okay? Uh, let me at least briefly tell you. Uh, 
how do we show, how do we know that the big bang is a well established uh, uh, theory or is it a proven fact well there are five lines of astronomical evidence uh, i won't deal much with it but i will just run through first you have what is called voluminous visual observational measurable and demonstrate demonstrable evidence the hubble's uh, images hubble's telescope images uh, in 1925, uh, Edwin Hubble established his observatory in California. Okay, and then the second evidence to confirm the Big Bang is if, now you get when you watch the bubble when you go on the on your Google and go to see these Hubble images, you see how galaxies are receding farther and farther away away from us. It shows, and the space begins to expand. You can actually uh, observe it and you can uh, take the measurements. And this is exactly what Einstein did. Einstein uh, did not believe that there is observational evidence. And then he, he, he made a trip uh, to the uh, Hubble observatory and he saw for himself and he made his uh, confession that the universe is indeed expanding. Okay, a second line of astronomical evidence is Albert Einstein's new uh, law of gravity. This is known as a general relativity, the theory of general relativity. What does the theory of general relativity say? It simply says the universe is, is, uh, begin, is, is on an expansion, on an average expansion from a, cos, from a finite cosmic beginning. That is, if you backtrack the dim to the dim antiquity, you find there's a point of time when it began to expand and it keeps expanding and expanding and the space becomes bigger and bigger, okay? The author, the author of Albert, the author of general theory in 1916, uh, tumbled upon this idea of uh, uh, big, the universe expanding. In 1916, Albert Einstein, uh, through his mathematical uh, field equations, discovered for himself that the universe is expanding. But now he, he did not, uh, uh, he did not agree with this, and then he did not publish this. He wanted to conform to the contemporary wisdom of the world. What, did, what was the contemporary understanding and wisdom of the universe? The universe always existed. There was no beginning. So now he started fudging with his own equations. And he started not arbitrarily changing, uh, changing the, uh, the figures, arbitrage. Now, and he published it in 1960. In, in 1927, uh, Edwin Hubble uh, um, um, spoke to Einstein and told him, please, there is overwhelming evidence, you can come and see. In 1931, Einstein makes a trip to California, visits the observatory and sees the evidence for himself. <coughs> and he makes a very, uh, I mean, he had the grace and the grandeur to admit that he, he erred in his judgment. And so he makes a statement, he says, denying the beginning of the universe was the greatest blunder of my a scientific career. Albert Einstein, after more than a decade, after 15 years, admitted that his first discovery of mathematical equations were perfectly correct, but he didn't uh, publish, he didn't accept it, and he did not publish it. So he had to backtrack, and uh, it's uh, to his credit that he admitted that he has made a mistake. Okay? Now let's move on to the, uh, one more, the third piece of evidence. We call this the space-time theorems of general relativity. General relativity is the most uh, exhaustively and vig rigorously tested principle in all of physics. Uh, why? Uh, in under different contexts, there. Why did they do that? Because it has got serious implications. It has got theological implications. It got. It has got worldwide implications. And so, what our uh, scientists have done was to subject it to rigorous, uh, rigorous and exhaustive testing under different contexts and space-time theorems. Now, the first theorem, let me explain to you the first theorem that is developed on the basis of general theory of relativity. Uh, this is a mathematical theorem developed by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose in 1970. This theorem establishes that if the universe has two conditions, condition one is does mass exist, condition two, uh, the condition two is the movements of the uh, bodies in the universe are reliably expressed in the mathem in the equations in the mathematical equation. If these two conditions are fulfilled, then this theorem says time itself, time and space itself came into existence. 
the time itself must have begun at a finite point of time. That is what, uh, what this theorem says is, uh, Stephen Hawkins and Roger Penrose theorem says, time was created at the beginning of the universe. Uh, that, that is what the theorem says. Time did not, the dimension of time did not exist. Let's move on. So how did the time and space come into existence? Because of a causal agent beyond space and time, because of a transcendent cause or a transcendent agent. Well, okay. Now there's another theorem. Um, there is a more powerful theorem. Uh, three non-believer scientists, Alexander Wellington, Alan Bode, and George Lamentry. What they did is they studied this theorem and they wanted to avoid the conclusion that the universe has a, a, as a, as a, as a, as a beginning, a transcendent beginning. They didn't like this idea. So for 10 years, they, they made some, in person, they, they made independent investigation and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, investigations and findings. And they wanted to show that uh, this uh, transcendent cause or a transcendent uh, a beginner outside time is, is wrong, they wanted. But they discovered exactly the opposite of it. And then they ended up discovering the exact opposite. They said there is a more powerful a theorem, a second theorem. This theorem says any universe that keeps expanding on an average itself has a beginning. Uh, outside matter, energy, space, and time. This second theorem is a more powerful theorem. It says there is only one condition. Is the universe expanding on an average from day one? If this is true, then Time itself began at a, at a finite time in the past, okay? Uh, so what this means is there is no longer any doubt that a transcendent cause, or you may like to call it a transcendent God exists outside time and space. And uh, that is one line of argument. And one last uh, line of, uh, sorry, please. Okay. Uh, and then that's about it. Uh, we have seen evidences. We have seen uh, what are the, Hubble's images, and then we also have seen uh, general theory of relativity, space-time theorems, and uh, uh, we can, and then the, the, the last one I have written, jotted down, is the dark energy. Okay, we we'll leave it at that. Uh, dark energy, it says that in the universe, the rate of expansion you know, should be finely and perfectly true, otherwise life is not possible. Okay, uh, we'll stop at that, and then uh, let me see what's our time. Uh, or you want to ask any questions? Yeah, I think we are left with 10 minutes. Sir, can we wind up, sir? Uh, oh. <laughs> I, I wanted to explain what is the significance of general theory of relativity and, and space-time theorems. And with that, end up uh, the scientific presentation. If you can, uh, if you can connect that yes. with the scripture, Okay, uh, it might be just helpful. Okay, sir. okay, we, we'll stop very briefly. Uh, I wanted to show you how significant are these uh, the, the general theory of relativity, the space time theorems, and uh, the dark energy fine tuning and the Hubble's image. I wanted to show you, explain briefly, but we'll skip that. Okay, now let's go to the biblical uh, 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 version. What does the Bible say regarding the universe, its origin? Okay. Uh, let me uh, share with you at least a few uh, points. Okay, biblical evidence. We are talking about the biblical cosmology. The Bible deals about the universe. Okay, the Bible says the universe began to exist, and it requires a beginner. Uh, uh, I don't have to explain this point. The universe began at a particular finite time in the dim antiquity, and it had a beginner. Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very clearly, na, as clear as the noonday, God's revelation tells you and me the universe came into existence and the uni universe began. God created the universe, the universe, the, the heavens and the earth. Now, remember, whenever in the scriptures you get the word the heavens and the earth, uh, the, the prefix D, you can straight away conclude it is talking of the universe or the cosmos. It is not talking of the of planet Earth. What do I mean by universe? By, by universe, I mean all the physical, uh, uh, all the totality of physical things, matter, energy, space, and time. So in this Genesis 1, God is telling us the universe was created. Uh, one more text, let me share. Hebrews chapter 11, 3. 
by faith we understand that the universe was, was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Uh, this verse is telling us uh, God created the universe and then uh, what we see, uh, what we have was using us for form that God's what is seen was not was not made out of what was visible. Okay, how did God create the universe? He did not create it to pass uh, through some something that was visible. It's a brand new creation. God brought the universe into existence. It's a totally brand new. He did not create it out of any pre-existing material. Okay, uh, that's what it says. Uh, the Bible says time began. It had a singularity beginning. At a particular time, point of time, God brings matter, energy, space and time into, into existence. A second a factor that the Bible says is time itself began to exist. The dimensions of time did not exist uh, in the uh, exist world. But at a particular point of time, God intervened and brought time. Um, Second Timothy 1 9. Okay. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. God is telling time did not exist and he brought it into existence. Christianity teaches that time is linear. It had an uh, inexorably move forward. It had a definite starting point. It had a definite past, a definite a present and a future. Okay, let's move on to the third. Let's move on to the next factor that the Bible says. The Bible says the universe is expanding. Now, how do we know the universe is expanding? Uh, the biblical writers you know, describe the universe. Uh, if you read the mosaic writings, you will not find the word you know, uh, expanding. It only says God created. Uh, so the, the mosaic writings does not tell us the universe is on you know, an average expansion. You have to go back to the oldest book in the uh, the oldest book in the uh, Old Testament. It is the book of Job, and Job talks about the expansion of the universe. He is the first person to teach and to predict the universe is expanding. Job chapter 9 verse 8 says, he alone stretches out the heavens and, and treads on the waves of the earth. And then uh, we have a number of scriptures. I can quote about more than one dozen scriptures. The Psalms 104 2 says, says, the Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. Now the English word uh, stretches out is a weak translation. The original Hebrew word was Natan. Now it should be rendered as expansion. Uh, the writers meant the, the universe as, is expanding. Okay, uh, that's about it. Hmm? Now, so Job is, uh, the Bible says the universe is expanding. You find this evidence in, the, in Job and in other Old Testament, but not in the Mosaic writing. Let's move on to the third uh, uh, factor, the Big Bang. Constant and constancy of the law of physics. Uh, we, I think we are all aware of it. Uh, uh, God specifically tells the, the Jews in the book of Jeremiah uh, he, that he tells he tells Jews, "You change. I don't change. I'm immutable. I'm changeless." As proof that I don't change, look at the laws of the universe. They don't change, and just as though they don't change, I don't change. God is telling the Jews that is change, changeless, is immutable. Uh, Gen I mean, Jeremiah chapter 33. Read the whole chapter. Jeremiah 30, chapter 33, 25 to 26. This is what the Lord says. If I have not made my covenant with the day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth, then I will uh, reject. I mean, I left out the later, later part. If I have not made... The, if I have not made the covenant with day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth. Now, Jeremiah 33 clearly explains the universe operates on fixed laws. Uh, let's move to the last uh, big bang uh, component and that is the law of decay. Okay, uh, Romans chapter eight, uh, Romans chapter eight verses 18 to 21. I think we're all familiar with this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager expectation of the children of Israel to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay 
Please note this phraseology. The, the creation will be delivered, liberated from its bondage of decay and brought into freedom of the glory of the children of God. In this particular book verse, uh, Paul, the apostle Paul is telling us the whole universe is, is a, a decaying. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, and then the Bible's accurate prediction. Uh, remember, Job was uh, that's about it, about a decay, law of decay. Uh, the, the Bible not only makes statements about the universe, it also predicts. Remember Job? Job's writing predates mosaic writing by 500 to 600. It means for the past 2,600 years, the Bible was the only uh, scientific record, the only philosophical record, the only historical record, the only record that spoke and predicted about an expanding universe. Uh, that's about it. And then uh, if I can, if I can leave the, open the floor for any questions. Yes, sir, any, I think. Thank you, Franklin. Uh, we are close to time, but we just maybe we'll take an extra few minutes to accommodate any questions that you might have. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, address your question to Franklin. I must certainly say that, Franklin, your presentation has been uh, uh, mind expanding, mind boggling, <laughs> mind explosion. <laughs> there are a lot of facts that, uh, that you have uh, presented. Anyway, the floor is open for any questions. We will extend it by a few minutes. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Praveen, go ahead. Perhaps I would like to bring a um, few thoughts uh, to consideration. Number one, how does law of, um, I mean, the center of gravity works in your explanations? Because center of gravity is one of the most important things. If center, yes. the law of center of gravity is missing, everything falls apart in general, everything. So if you talk about expansion or if you talk about beginning law of uh, center of gravity is going to be one of the main um, main uh, thing to be considered. If it is expanding, from where is it expanding? That has to be explained. Even if you say Big Bang, where, where it happened? So center of gravity is very important. So it would be good if you could uh, throw some light on it. That is number one. And number two thing I would like to bring before you is I, uh, I appreciate a, a scientific look at the scripture. But at the same time, I'm, I come from uh, studying the scripture according to the rules of interpretation. When we do that, uh, various there is a possibility that we we, um, uh, we look into we read into the text certain things. Uh, there are certain points uh, I would like to bring to your notice. Number one was uh, the comments on heaven stretching and uh, the waves, uh, taken from Book of Job. And book of Psalms. Uh, these are written, these are poetical books. So those are uh, uh, figurative in nature. And uh, even those words, they they thought they just talk about. Author was saying uh, he was not able to explain the <clears throat> vastness. So he is speaking about heaven, and he is not able to speak about the beginning and the number of waves. And also he was talking about the waves. So the, does it mean God is the one who was uh, stirring up the waters in the sea uh, so so that we get the waves. <laughs> so we cannot may I, I personally feel we may not be able to make certain uh, come in, uh, certain things scientific, especially taking from book of uh, books of uh, the what we call uh, poetry and prophecy. See, seriously, we need to look at those as poetry and prophecy. And last one example, just it's a funny question. That's that was from Romans chapter eight. The question was many mentioned. Oh, so the earth was uh, the uh, sorry entire creation was uh, waiting with groanings for the redemption from the corruption, right? So 
uh, if we say that uh, corruption is the law, it is there, so earth is going towards corruption. Okay, I appreciate that. Then next word says the entire creation is waiting for the redemption. So where do we need to focus now? We need to focus on the corruption part of the creation or we need to focus on the redemption part of the creation. <laughs> where do I need to put uh, my spiritual focus or relational focus in that? So should I feel happy because it is talking about corruption or should I feel happy it is talking uh, if it is going to be corrupted and it happened, then uh, the promise of redemption, that also we need to look and uh, balance uh, these two. This is just on a fun note. Praveen, uh, good points, very good points. I mean, I agree with you, but let me make a, some quick observations. You see, uh, the law of gravity works, but there is also a counter law, which keeps uh, the dark energy. You see, the, the it no, keeps... I'm not talking about law of gravity, Angul. Center of gravity, I asked. Uh, the law of gravity works to slow down the uh, expansion of the universe. And uh, the dark energy na, keeps expanding it. But this is this has to be fine-tuned. Only then na, uh, it, we, we will be able to have life on the planet Earth. And another observation you made was regarding... Uh, what was that about? Uh, corruption. The law of decay takes its toll. Even the law of decay now is fine-tuned. God cre uh, created the law of decay and it fine-tuned it. The law of decay is not too much. If it is too much, it will discourage productive work. You don't feel like doing. Why should I work? And say, But the law of decay is not too low as to promote laziness or promote you know, letharginess. So maybe I'll explain in my next session how the law of gravity, to, the law of decay also is fine-tuned. And one last... Uh, comment is the ulti if you allow the big bang if the big bang operates the universe is coming to it's going to collapse one day or it'll burn out and that is what the bible says a new heavens and a new earth are coming you see that means there is coming according to the bible there is a time when this when the present universe will have run its course and it'll come to an end yes sir, anything else I, yeah i appreciate uh, your comments uh, what I wanted to do was answer a, a few uh, of the quiz program that I presented, but let me see if anyone else has any more questions. Go ahead, sir. Anybody else? Any comments or any uh, anything you'd like to point out from the presentation? Feel free to do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, Franklin can conclude by some points that he wanted to make. Yes, sir. Oh, I will just conclude. Yeah, just, by... want, just, uh, just a request. Like, can we get the notes of uh, what uh, Mr. Poppins had presented? Like, if it is possible to share it with us, uh, maybe I would like to go through it when I'm free. Sure, sir. And uh, mm -hmm. add it to my resources. Yeah. As I'm explaining, I'll also look into it and I'll see what uh, what are some of the things that needs to have some deeper study. Okay. So if you can give it to me in a PDF file or a Word file or a PPT, that would be very good. Thank you. Sure, sir. I can give you the script that I prepared for my independent study. I can share that, but uh, you can also go to the websites of Dr. Euros, Reasons to Believe, and our own website. Okay? Okay. Uh, any, more, any more questions, please, from anybody else? You can go ahead and conclude. Okay. okay. Let me conclude by giving you the answers for my quiz program. Uh, what was the first question I asked? Now, can you can the existence of God be scientific? Can the can you prove the existence of God? Yes, the existence of God can be proved. Uh, how do we prove that? You take space-time theorems. What does space-time theorem says? Space-time theorem says. Uh, 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 space-time theorem proves that there is a cause of agent that brought the universe existing. This cause of agent works independently outside uh, matter, energy, space, and time. So the Big Bang, cause, Big Bang is talking of a causal agent or a transcendent uh, beginning. They don't call it God, but you and I, we know who caused the universe to come into existence. So does can science prove there is a God? Yes, the space-time theorems are conclusive and they are, they are incontroversial. They say that the universe, this scientific evidence, please, you can check. 
uh, check the two uh, space time theorem it says the universe came into existence independently of a cause beyond the universe itself that was that they are saying there is a transcendent cause now we call it a god the transcendent god okay i uh, know any is please any more any doubts okay second the second question uh, is the the scientific evidence says that god is a personal god the answer is yes uh, look at the dark energy to what degree it was fine tuned can you understand to what degree it was fine tuned this shows the one behind fine the fine tuning of the dark energy had intelligence he had knowledge he had inventiveness he had all the faculties only then it is possible it's there to only then it is possible to have a personal way the trap the dark energy uh, fine tuning shows that uh, the one behind the dark energy was a personal god only a personal god can be uh, can bring such engineering marvels such you know perfectly orchestrated uh, things to existence so science does prove that god is personal even though the big bang uh, our friends in atheism atheist materialists don't accept it please study the bigger the fine tuning and then uh, it what is the conclusion that you draw okay uh, make, maybe in the next episode we can take up okay then i asked one question uh, is the big bang model good news or bad news now this question depends upon what is your take on reality according to atheists materialists and science and uh, naturalists the ultimate reality is the universe only physical things but for christians and all believers the reality is something beyond the physic physicality it's something beyond god is our ultimate reality and once you decide this fundamental factor uh, you can say it is good news or bad news it is bad news the big bang model is a bad news for atheists for materialists for naturalists the more worst part is the universe is coming to a crashing uh, close okay the the big bang model is a good news how for all christians and believers uh, the big bang pictures even if the universe winds up the, now the, all the parameters of the big bang were uh, were confirmed in were confirmed are confirmed in the bible and the last remember the last uh, point the universe is on on is coming to a uh, end is coming to an end it may it may collapse or burn out that is what the bible speaks the book of revelation says a new heavens and a new earth is coming the the point is the big bang model is good news it the, all the parameters of the big bang confirm uh, the the veracity of the bible they confirm that the bible is true 100% true okay uh, please think it over maybe you can uh, ask me in the next session too okay who was the first to to speak and teach about the big bang it is not einstein remember einstein in 1916 uh, discovered through his mathematical equations uh, found out that the universe is ex expanding how is it expanding from a finite uh, beginning point okay he was the first and subsequently hubble through his uh, telescopic images confirmed it and then you have other uh, if you look at the timeline you have uh, space time theorems dark energy but uh, uh, as christian uh, according to scientists uh, uh, to see uh, from 4th century to uh, 1960 that is a, a lapse of 1000 years for 1600 years what was the paradigm in the scientific community what did the world believe the universe is eternal and it it had, did not have a beginning now in contrast to this the bible says that, that the universe came into existence who spoke about okay that was uh, i answered the question who spoke first it was job 2600 years can you imagine eh, when there was no computers when there was no uh, advanced technology telescopes and then mathematical theorems how well job spoke okay hmm. i will see if anybody requires i can share my script and you can come to me later on okay let's take another question uh, which uh, i think i asked the question Uh, which is the, which is the only world view that is accurate 100% in its cosmology uh, excuse me please
okay, uh, which is the only worldview that is accurate 100% in its cosmology. Uh, let's say there is a worldview which talks about uh, cosmo, which has its own cosmology. Do the scientific uh, findings uh, match with that, or are they? Is there a discrepancy? Now, when you come to Christianity, you see the more the the, same, the findings and the research uh, conclusions of the last one hundred years confirm uh, the, the the truthfulness of the Bible. It is saying the Bible is accurate on all the parameters. Take the singularity beginning, take the expansion, uh, take the uh, on and on. So, which is the worldview uh, that uh, the, the, Christ, the biblical worldview or the Christian worldview is the only worldview that is 100% accurate in its cosmology? Remember, <coughs> the Bible talks a lot about, uh, the Bible has its own cosmology and its uh, statements and predictions are confirmed by the Bible. Singularity beginning, transcendental beginning, and then time began to exist. Universe is expanding from its cosmic beginning. Fixed laws, the law of uh, decay. All these are being are, are confirmed by Big Bang uh, recent scientific findings. Okay, Christianity soars to dazzling and spectacular heights. No other worldview comes near near to it. Uh, I can put it this way. Hmm. Atheism, materialism, and naturalism, and all other worldviews goes for a toss. Or if I may please borrow uh, the phraseology of a pastor. Uh, recently, a pastor used, uh, he perfected, and he fine-tuned and perfected a, a phrase, uh, which I used first. I said, clean bold. But pastor fine-tuned it, and he perfected this, this phraseology. And he went on, went on to say, uh, clean bold with uh, Clean bowl with a googly middle stamp off. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I, it's both this particular fine tuning and perfection of this phraseology is just beautiful. It is humorous and most of all, it is telling. You see, it tells a lot. See, if your middle stamp is off, then you're not fit to be a, a batsman. You can resign and then you can go and do change your profession. Similarly, our, our atheists, naturalists, and materialists should resign their chairs and go and uh, take up agriculture and dig the lands. So uh, what we what I want to say is atheism, materialism, naturalism, and all other worldviews are clean bold with, with the googly and middle stamp off. Yes, please. Uh, any comments? Uh, uh, let me add a few more things. Uh, there is an Eastern worldview which says the cosmos uh, is governed by the what you call reincarnation principle. Uh, they call it reincarnation. I won't name it. Uh, it's called, but we know it is the oscillating theory. The oscillating theory says. Franklin, if I can regular... just interject here. Yes, sir. Uh, can I just come in? Uh, okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, if you can keep the next few comments for the next session, is would that be okay? Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Right, because we we have quite a bit of information now, <laughs> and uh, we have already passed uh, gone thirteen minutes uh, ahead, and so uh, let's end it here, okay. and then we will conclude uh, in the next session. Thank you so much for all of you joining us. Uh, you might probably know by now that I used to play cricket, so um, <laughs> I uh, was able to perfect uh, Franklin's uh, phraseology. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and close in, 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 in prayer and thank God for this time. If I can request Emmanuel, if that's okay with you, to lead us in a closing prayer. Thank you, Emmanuel. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come for your throne of grace. Thank you so much for this time, Lord. Even as we have uh, spent a quality time, Lord, listening uh, to your word uh, in relation to science and uh, in relation to the cosmology, the universe, uh, uh, Lord, the origin of it and how the, the scripture tells about, uh, you know, these things, Lord, it's as, uh, as we come to hear this, it, it's really amazing. It's mind boggling to see that uh, you have actually established yourself. Uh, through the scriptures and uh, mankind is not able to comprehend the Lord Master because it's go it because these things goes 
these things you know goes far beyond our comprehension and understanding of our past lord but uh, hearing all these things only one thing uh, you know comes to our mind is like we stand in awe of who you are we stand in awe of uh, you who you have been for oh lot master lord jesus lord thank you lord thank you so much for bringing uh, this wonderful information this wonderful uh, connection between the scriptures and and the signs of oh our master god lord jesus thank you lord uh, even as we are going to hear the next part the next week lord uh, please to uh, help us to understand these concepts for oh lot master lord so that, lord our desire our need uh, lord uh, you know to read the scripture increases oh lord master god lord and to look at the nature and praise you for who you really are oh lord master god lord thank you so very much we give you all glory and honor lord till till we meet again oh lord master lord uh, please to be with us protect us from all evil danger and harm keep us safe and healthy lord and enable us so that lord we would continue lord jesus lord uh, to continue to portray your love uh, to to our neighbors to our dear and dear ones uh, to our family members and so on oh lord So we give you all glory and honor, Lord, in Jesus' precious and matchless and powerful name. Amen. 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 And thank you again, Franklin and Emmanuel, leading us the closing prayer. And uh, we wish you all a very good evening. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, in the concluding part of uh, Franklin's presentation. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you.